All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to um, the Orange Brick Road podcast. Um, today, we're going to be covering the second report from the A16Z Crypto 2003 report. Uh, what we've been doing is covering uh, the overview of the crypto market, um, the progress in research and development, setbacks with crypto platforms like collapses like FTX, um, prices are following the crypto cycles, uh, bad regulations creating uncertainty, decentralization is becoming an opportunity, the state of crypto market cycles trends, uh, metrics indicators, the 12 crypto predictions, and what does this all mean to the crypto market. All right, and today we're joined um, by Sophie and Ainsley. Um, Sophie, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, give yourself a little intro. Hi, Brandon. Hello, Ainsley. Good to see you both again. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here with you. So I am finance and crypto analyst with Ocean Floor Music. Um, they're a Web3 music platform business. So um, doing really great things to help musicians um, use Web3 tools to create, um, you know, decent revenue and income for themselves. Um, I'm also a cryptocurrency consultant with CryptoSense. So today I'm speaking in my own personal capacity and I do have views that come from both what I'm seeing in the state of crypto report and also from my own fundamental analysis um, in the markets. Right, Angelique. Yes, thanks, Brandon. And hi, Sophie. Uh, it's great to be here. My name's Ainsley. I'm from Layer1x. We are a local Perth blockchain. Uh, it's very, very interesting to see this very well thought out uh, and concisely put together report um, and just see what where the market's going and that they value decentralization as a as one of the key opportunities for the next era of Web3. So I'm um, looking forward to uh, discussing that today. All right. Well, let's just dive straight into it, shall we? If you want to bring it up, Sophie. I will. I shall share my screen. And as I do that, I just thought I'd um, also do a little shout out of um, gratitude to A16Z because, you know, it's actually a really decent piece of thorough research which can help people who are quite new to the markets as much as those who are already invested or participating or users of uh, blockchains, apps and platforms, et cetera. So I thought that this is a really great way to, you know, make it more meaningful to ourselves as everyday um, users in this space. So it's a 60 page report and we'll do our best to go through whatever comes to mind. Um, and this is, an overview. I think you already set us up, um, Brandon, you know, with with these um, ideas around progress, setbacks, cycles, regulation and opportunities. And I thought it could be good just to touch on an overview before we move through and look at more in depth uh, what's happening um, with this report and as it reflects the market. So maybe Ainsley, is there anything you'd like to say about, you know, these three key um, well, one thing that I'm uh, particularly focused on, really keen about, is the difference um, that they've they've specified about blockchains and crypto. Um, blockchains are the infrastructure, the the computers, the the way that Web three is delivered, um, and crypto uh, are essentially the protocols, the the applications that are are delivered by this blockchain infrastructure. So it's been very care, um, good to do that, and also to differentiate that. Web3 is, is an evolution of the website, of the whole internet. And I'd like to just carry on from there. I mean, you know, it, it has been said to me by many people, you know, um, let's just put everything related to crypto blockchain and Web3 into um, being a finance, the financial markets, like alternative financial markets. But I think, you know, referencing it is as an evolution of the internet, you know, it brings absolutely every piece of technology, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be, um, you know, coding languages, like if, even the devices that we use to tap into the internet, you know, all of that um, come into play with, with Web3. So I think that's a very powerful way of looking at the markets. And, and I think as well, the financial aspect of what, what Web3 um, and the blockchain can deliver is just one element of it. I mean, you've got sort of uh, every industry, every application that can be transferred to blockchain to, uh, you know, to, to, in most cases, benefit everything. 
And so we step through and take a look at, you know, well, why does Web3 matter? I mean, I think it does. And, you know, it is a question. So maybe we could just quickly unpack that together. And I don't think this is a surprising um, framework. It literally is just looking at, you know, where were we with Web1, Web2, and here we are um, with Web3. You know, there are certain characteristics which define what Web3 are. And, you know, if you are a participant in, you know, a cryptocurrency blockchain or um, a Web3 project, or application or marketplace, you know, this is what is underlying your activity. Maybe you don't see it so much, but um, there is decentralization of networks going on behind the scenes. There is governance. Um, and then there is new functionality that is coming into the market. And I know Ainsley, with the work that um, has been done at Layer 1X, I would kind of quite clearly put Layer 1X into advanced functionality. Absolutely, absolutely, because um, it, the the delivery of this capability is is really what blockchain technology can do, and and essentially, Web three is the promise has been built on the promise of decentralization, of security, of scalability, and um, and also of of the ability to. Well, what's been lacking to date has been the ability for the whole ecosystem to connect safely, and we'll get to that as one of the main risk points. But uh, yeah, the promise of, of Web3 um, and really we're at a point where it's evolving very quickly and, and I really do believe that Layer 1X is, is the next evolution of, of Web3 and, and how it's delivered to everyone and to help with the mass adoption. I think what's also interesting about this, you know, the four dot points under Web3 is that fourth one about value. And I think value is not always understood particularly well. I think it's often people will think about price, which is spectacular. Um, those are secondary market valuations of um, cryptocurrencies and the projects that are associated with them. Um, and often we don't dig enough beneath the surface to say, well, what are the fundamentals of those businesses? And I'll just call them businesses uh, because in this report, they think about um, blockchains and um, applications as being businesses or products, which I think is a really nice nuance to make, um, as opposed to the cryptocurrency, which is traded on open markets, which are financial reflections of value. And, and the whole thing about Web3 is, is it is peer-to-peer, -peer, whether that be, you know, protocol to individual or, or individual to individual. And that value is also uh, your benefit as an individual by, by having control of your own data and your own, uh, your own identity. So Web3, Web you know, really does democratise ownership. Yeah, I think this fits right, quite well to it, doesn't it? Ownership. Sorry, Brandon, what were you going to say? I was going to say, yeah, because uh, during Web two, what people didn't re don't realise um, is that you're the product. They're using your data, your search engines, and they're selling it onto third parties. Whereas, you know, Web three, you're now taking ownership of your own data, and then you can give permission to certain applications when you so choose to. Um, you know, and the, the whole idea of of crypto is peer to peer. You know, and and to be a, have have your own sovereignty. So I think this is where, where Web three is really going to be taking over. And I think a little bit further down in the document, it talks about. Um, creatives, like creating, you know, Web3 applications, creating, uh, for example, even simple things like NFT collectibles, you know, that type of a thing that has been made possible um, through the th through the tools that have become available through the advancement um, into the Web3 space. So um, I think that's that's really, really interesting to to explore. And yeah, even though this looks linear, please, um, Angsley or Brandon, if you want to kind of jump ahead, you know, I can drive that conversation too. <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll see. It's just like a, like a, a musicians or, or sports people or any, any, anybody, they can actually create their own network through their own fan base and be getting rewarded directly as opposed to going through a middleman. So I think that that's where Web3 is really going to be taking over. And NFTs are really, really important part of that. Um, you know, the first evolution, I mean, we'll get to NFTs as well, but they're definitely an evolving technology, uh, not just a pretty picture that that not only helps you find your community, but to, you know, utilise your relationship with them and, and build your own um, assets, I guess. Yeah, I'm really thinking quite clearly about this um 
thesis here that users have more power and earn a greater share of revenue you know on web three versus web two platforms in fact i had a hedge fund manager say to me once so oh, i don't get the real big kind of like idea during the bull run about you know um web three spaces like who cares really <laughs> like what's the difference between them and web two um platforms because that's basically where their fund was invested and i actually sat down and i said well look the thesis is that you get to participate um financially as much as uh you know as you do as um you know use you get to choose you've got choices about where your attention um is given um you know do you want to use facebook or do you want to use steam it or do you want to use perhaps a particular platform that is going to financially reward you for your attention for bringing your your finances your energy you know your time and i said that's the big game changer here so um, yeah that, that functions through micropayments as well i mean i had um steve from perth heat the baseball team on the radio show on my radio show uh this afternoon and he bought something out that I, I didn't even know because I know that they're doing a lot of stuff there. But one thing that they are doing is um, through the Lightning Network, if a player hits a home run, people can send them a dollar or 10 cents or if they make a good catch or whatever, and they can actually send it directly to the player that's on the field at the time. I mean, that's just really exciting. Um, and yeah, that's where this technology is going. So it's it's, it's cutting out the middlemen and just, you, you're getting directly rewarded for the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Sorry, sorry, Kerry. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say it flips a lot of business models on their head mm -hmm. um, because yep. he's actually uh, the creator who are getting rewarded for their own um, their own talent, and that's 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 very democratic. It's fantastic. And it's it is. I mean, look at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You know, one hundred percent of revenue goes back to the decentralized organizations, where you know there is some effort with these other brands to share, you know, the revenue streams with um, participants, users, say musicians, for example, with Spotify. Um, and then here on the opposite side, I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what the accrual of value and payouts to um, participants is going to be. One thing, probably close to your heart, Ainsley, is with regards to, um, you know, those who are operating nodes and um, you know on on blockchains like what the um, financial incentives are to them so we've got kind of various layers I think of participants from those who are actually securing the network who are um, enabling the transactions to be made in a secure fashion those who are verifying um, you know transactions and then those who are actually using the applications that stack on top of it Absolutely. And you can actually become a participant in, in all of those things. Like um, Layer 1X, one of the ways that we actually um, validate the, the chain is to use a, a novel proof of participation consensus. And what that is, is actually everyone's mobile phone can actually become a validator. And, and it's a micro validation, but when when the validation happens, you actually are rewarded for participating in that creation. So um, that's not only um, from a creative point of view, it's actually being a participant in the whole, entire blockchain infrastructure as well. And dare I say, it, that sounds like it is more accessibility dependent upon how much is required to um, stake and become, you know, a validator on your network. I was thinking about over the weekend, we had a Tezos workshop here that Women Blockchain WA um, were um, co-partnering with. And, you know, like it's a 10 grand bag, right, of um, XTZ, which is the Tezos native crypto, to be, um, you know, um, a, a staking pool operator. So I think as perhaps, you know, the technology Technologies um, develop and also accessibility for everyday people to become participants. Mm -hmm. I've been just interested to see Ainsley with Layer One X and the use of mobile phones, which most people have everywhere in the world, how yes. that will impact um, participation. Absolutely. Well, um, there is a there is a tokenomics breakdown, but essentially, the twenty five percent of every fee goes to that mobile phone validation. So um, they are rewarded for being participants. Um, I think going back to as well we, the the user experience and uh, you know the creators getting rewarded and the and the people who are going to be onboarded participating in crypto. Um, one of the things that's really important in the coming cycle is to make the user experience as easy as possible. And I think to date, throughout the four cycles that we've been through in crypto, um, 
it's been very much targeted to people who love and are passionate about crypto and will bend over backwards in order to participate. But the applications of, of where crypto is heading and the delivery of decentralization, the delivery of this interoperability, the delivery of this scalability and security means we also have to deliver an experience that invites everyone to be a part of it. So that's going to be one of what I believe is going to be the uh, the key drivers to mass adoption. Getting that right will, will help yeah. mass adoption. Yeah, because, I mean, just to look at the evolution uh, of crypto, um, how clunky it was back in the year, uh, you know, back in the day to what we have now, you know, where you can trade off a telephone, you know, you, you can send things, so it, you know, it, it's instant. And that's what's giving it a lot of adoption is to make things seamless, like it's just a part of normal life as opposed to having to be a tech nerd or, you know, go on the dark net and, and that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's really interesting, you know, this one is about, you know, advancing the internet through crypto computers. I think we should be adding to that crypto devices. Um, you know, there are also people using Raspberry Pis, which are microcomputers, but I think even using mobile phones, which are at some level, you know, also computers, um, but in a different configuration. Um, and the fact that that makes, I feel, the idea of decentralization that much more um I feel truer than not, depending upon what can actually be run through a mobile phone, whether in fact you can have um, risk staked in um, the operation of, of a network. So I, I think it's really exciting times to see what functionality or advancements to functionality can be made. Oh, there's so many so quickly. So here we come into the market cycles. I think that's the one that most people have, um, you know, a passion for. Everyone talks about the markets. And if yep. you don't mind me just framing up very briefly, um, what I think is really interesting about this particular slide, it's the idea that we should, if we want to understand true value and um, crypto market cycles, we should put to the side price. It's not to say that it's not relevant, but if we think about price as being the more spectacular, more evident piece of what people see you know you can go to data aggregators you can go to trading uh, platforms and you can see what is the price of a particular cryptocurrency however what is a little bit more oblique or opaque are these other three ideas that are here like what is the interest what is the underlying network effect or the interest in a particular blockchain or an application um, etc or you know how many new ideas are spawning in this particular um, blockchain or ecosystem and then like how many startups or projects are actually getting funds like they're going through um, funding cycles and I know that um, you know funding cycles are necessary to get to the next level so any comment on this framework? I think it's a pretty nice, tidy framework. Yeah, well, I, I like it because it, it well, it's a growth loop and it is the, the growth loop of the entire ecosystem. So people, users are attracted in, well, you know, by the price potential, like crypto has been a, a wild breast ride from time to time. And so, you know, there is a promise of profits or, you know, in, in you know, getting into the ecosystem. And then, um, you know, when you get in, you learn more about it. And at the moment, we're really in a very exciting new idea and startup project stage when the market's not not quite as exciting. People aren't flooding in because of the price promise because we're in a bit of a flat time at the moment. But certainly um, there's a lot of evolution. There's a, a quite a big revolution going on in crypto. But this this is... You know, this this is a growth loop, a feedback loop, and and when this loop goes around, it is actually a really healthy ecosystem for blockchain and Web three in, in you know, in actuality. Do, do do you kind of think that the the price is the end result of the loop? You know, it, because like it's all the developments happening and behind the scenes, and like I, everything gets built in a bear market basically because you don't have that distraction. You know, so therefore, as things are getting built, people become interested and as they become interested and that's when they start investing and they start using social media and then the adoption cycle starts and then it's reflected in price. Or do you think it's the opposite price then sort of creates that loop? I think that they are related, yet I think they can actually stand apart. I feel that um, the financial markets, you know, they're driven by 
psychological, social, economic factors that may not necessarily be a re reflection of how the businesses themselves are actually performing. So, you know, for example, on social media, you'll be having, um, you know, maybe pump and dump schemes, or you might be having influencers who are talking up a particular crypto or, um, you know, anything in the FUD area, you know, that actually, I feel myself impacts directly um, pricing. Um, there are also economic factors, um, inflation, uh, you know, bank collapses, <laughs> as we've seen over the last, uh, you know, 12 months. So therefore, you know, they impact on finances. However, those other three metrics, the interest, social media activity as, um, as shown by Twitter, um, interaction developer activity, and the actual rounds of funding that projects are, are receiving, I think are a little bit separate. They're like how well businesses are operating um, in the space. So as you can see there, even though they are quite positive, I think the one that kind of blew me away was the incredible resilience of developer activity in the yep. cryptocurrency market. Yep. Yeah, I was not expecting that. Yeah. Mm. I think I think if everyone who's in the space recognizes the potential of what it can offer, yeah. and uh, that there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm not a developer myself, but I do know from other developers that I've spoken to, and then just looking at you know the authors of the report, you know they really point clearly to the fact that if you are a cryptocurrency developer or a blockchain developer, there's a tendency to want to stay with that um, language. There's what they call a stickiness. So I think that's a pretty interesting um, phenomenon. This one here, I think, is quite interesting as well because it helps us understand whatever your involvement in um, the crypto, blockchain, Web3 space, just how various technologies, how they've come to market, have influenced the launching of different products. And that's what this uh, this graph represents. It kind of plots all the way along, like we're in the technology uh, development cycle have products actually come to market so any comments about that I think it's really interesting well I, I personally like the question mark because there's so yeah. much innovation <laughs> happening right now so um, but also you're looking at all this and you do see that in uh, in times of slump some of the most iconic companies in the world have been have been launched uh, and have survived. So that's really, that's really interesting. Innovation definitely never finishes. And, and a lot of the things at each point along here, they were actually conceptually never done before. And so what is possible, you know, in the future conceptually that hasn't even been thought of yet. It's really exciting. I, so Brandon. Yeah. I don't think we've seen anything yet. You know, um, we did this uh, analogy with Alan Stokes the other day um, on a podcast where he went, um, the the um, the dot com boom. You know, basically, if you had a like a business and you just put dot com after it, and then it just went up and to the right. You know, people were just piling in on anything that was dot com, and crypto, in a sense, is going through that cycle where you know, like just coins, and they can just be meme coins, they can be shit coins, they can have no utility. Um, and you've got thousands and thousands of coins now, but out of the dot com boom, you got Google, you got Amazon, you know, you've got these big Facebook. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, go right down the line. So out of the 10,000 or 100,000 or whatever it was, dot .com, um, you, you've got, you know, three or 4,000 um, companies that have formed from that, you know, and that's where I see crypto is at it as, as well. Yeah, I thought it was really fun to think about, like, for example, the advancement of um, smartphones, um, even yeah. though they were around back in, you know, Blackberries back in 1999. I had one with work <laughs> in the TradFi sector. Um, but looking at in 2008 with the advancements in iPhones, I think they were launched into the market around about that time period as Airbnb, Pinterest and Bitcoin. So, you know, um, that I think has been a huge game changer, hasn't it, particularly for uh, the Web3 crypto blockchain space, people being able to access um, through their iPhones rather than having big computers, laptops, which are higher priced devices um, in terms of um, direct accessibility. And like you, Ainsley, yeah, I'm really interested to see, you know, what happens with the question mark. So just having a look at the trends um, to watch. Um, hmm. Well, this is interesting. <laughs> interesting. Um, 
Well, I, I, I think, um, well, new layer ones, we are a new layer one. And I seeing what we're doing and the fact that we allow interoperability across the tro- across the blockchain at a layer one consensus level, that native connectivity, that's been missing from the blockchain to date. And all these layer ones being discussed, they've all got their benefits, but none of them are able to do that, yet all of them are able to benefit from it. So um, when 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 layer one x is launched and we're we're able to do that and actually connect at a layer one level all of these blockchains then all of them will be able to scale to deliver their potential and i think that's just so exciting because the the they're choosing siloed paths at the moment but very soon they won't need to and actually when when crypto and blockchain technologies become this great synergy of everyone working together that's going to be when everyone can achieve their potential and it's and it, it's just very exciting to see right this is the state of play literally um in the last 12 months but already in the next 12 months it's it's already going to radically change yes i also think what's pretty exciting is that we are seeing the creation of um, blockchains which are specifically de- designed for for specific applications and look I mean, as much as I love the technology, you know, I'm not over, all over the depth of it, but I do see, um, and you know, the, the the feasibility for so much more growth. Um, I think one of the interesting pieces around zero knowledge rollups and also the um, yeah the, the, the whole the, the whole issues of um, scalability and you know growth security. I mean, I think they all occupy, um, you know, a really valid space in the paths for you know, advancement. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Like the ZK roll-ups are, are really, uh, most of them are focused on scaling the Ethereum network. And what they do is they really help with the fees, lowering the fees, and they also really help with the speed of transactions because with their zero knowledge, they can um, validate what's already happening on the chain itself. Um, yeah, they're, they're definitely there to scale one particular blockchain, but they they don't talk to others at the moment. So it's interesting. Um, do, you, do you kind of feel like it's almost like they're, they're, uh, at this stage is like um, where computing was at, uh, you know, in the sort of mid to late 90s? Where you had Apple and um and and all these people that were building different applications, and 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 different things like Word and um, Excel and all this sort of stuff, but then, um, what Microsoft and Apple did was uh, do company buyouts and actually involve them. So now they got a package, you know, so everything becomes seamless. So it's kind of seems like it's at the stage where you've got these individual projects that are, like you said, are like a silos within themselves. Mm. And I think the next evolution is going to be the communication between them all, you know, the seamless communication. So instead of a company acquiring or buying out or merging, right, um, they're still keeping separate but the merge is actually just through technology. Yes. Does yes. that make sense? And, and things and and it allows people to and protocols and chains to really specialize as well because they can stay in their lane. They, yeah, they can well, they can choose a lane and really focus on on, on delivering the best possible outcome for the user. But um uh the user will be safe in using the ecosystem too, which is absolutely vital because at the moment there's a lot of centralized points of failure where what's at risk are, are assets of individuals. Um, so eliminating that risk, eliminating bridges, and just allowing that communication where the whole ecosystem can communicate safely. Uh, you know, it's like if you think back when uh, your mobile phones were first invented, if we couldn't, if you were on an Optus um, network and I'm on Telstra and we both got a mobile phone but we can't talk to each other, then what's the point? Where so, and that's what crypto, that's what blockchain tech is at the moment. Um, that everyone's working in little siloed ecosystems. Whereas what we want to be doing is pick up our mobile phone and call our friend. So that's where that's what the promise of 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 Web three and 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 Layer One X is definitely able to deliver, and it's really exciting. And I think you know, like this sort of report, it's talking about trends to watch, but it hasn't mentioned that. And I think that's kind of a bit of a glaring omission. Um, in amongst all the other exciting things that are happening in the ecosystem. I think yeah, it's probably because, you know, there's like not, not a lot of 
been focused on that particular phenomenon and um yep. it is one that is i think at a really kind of you know initial stage maybe yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so it'd be great to see where that goes i thought it was really interesting to look at um the payment of fees you know um where do the fees that uh, operate the ethereum network come from so um yeah interesting um the percentages that all of these um, layer twos are literally paying to the Ethereum base layer. And that's what you pay for security. So fees are worthy of being paid. I mean, security does cost. Yep. Freedom ain't free. <laughs> and I know this is all about Ethereum, but, um, mm. you know, this is some of the trends that um, the, the report is pointing to in terms of energy saving consensus mechanisms. I mean, I, I don't have any data on that, but um, it does look quite interesting what the before and after looks like. I mean, the reduction to what is that? 99.9%. .9%, I guess time will tell after it's been operating for, you know, um, a period of 12 months, what that actually means. Yeah. It's interesting. Like the, the, the proof of work to proof of stake has definitely been uh, a big saver in in in, in energy. Um, yeah. Just want to see it reflected in prices. That would be nice. Uh, well, less the gas is, fees. The thing about it is it's not really the network that's uh, – so the way Ethereum's set up is that the nodes are very deterministic. They um, – Mm -hmm. They actually hunt out for the most fees, so that's why you know you can cut lines, pay more gas fees to get your your um, smart contract executed first, your trade done first on Ethereum. Whereas um, if if a blockchain is offering a non deterministic free fee structure, then you're not up to that price gouging. So that's you know it's it's one of the weaknesses of Ethereum and something that the zk rollups do seek to. Um, help you know for users ZK rollups on Ethereum are a good thing because you're paying less fees, but there's definitely um, you know other ways to pay less fees as well. So yeah, yeah, agreed. So that's just an interesting, I think, um, ideal of you know comparing um, energy consumption. So um, proof of stake with YouTube. <laughs> yeah. So this is an interesting one about just staking in general. Staking transforms collateral into outsized economic security. Any thoughts on that? I mean, you know, staking is important in terms of, um, yeah, funding the resources needed to um, perpetuate um, a blockchain. I know this is Ethereum focused, but it does get a little more general as we go through the report. Yeah, it's almost like the democratization um, of the network so people can participate in it to secure it, you know. So by participating in it um, through staking, you're getting rewarded by securing the network. So it's like a win-win, you know. I think it's also very interesting to look at um, the requirements for staking as well. They do have, um, you know, a cost. So it's, yeah, it'd be interesting to see, like, um, will that change? I'm not aware of it over time. Um, 32 ETH is quite a, an amount to um, run a staking node. So that's just staking on ETH, though, isn't it? it it's yeah. um yeah yeah yeah. It, there's a lot of developments going along in in DeFi in terms of um yeah how to how to stake and where the best opportunities for users are. But yeah, I mean yeah. Yeah, to participate in proof of staking. So that's just interesting, you know, like um, where will the market go and how will, um, I guess, competitivity in this in, in this space, like encourage other creators and developers to offer more accessible terms? Well, do, do you think there is a risk, like you use 32 ETH that's required? So say, for example, I don't have 32 ETH, and but I've got 10 and you've got 10 and Ainsley's got 12, right? Or we, we can um, create a pool or you can create your own pool and get other people to put like five ETH in, three ETH in, two, 20, whatever it may be to, to get the requirement. But by doing that, you're giving your keys up, yeah. you know, to a third party. So they've almost made it like a barrier of entry um, where normal people, um, in order to participate in the network, when I say normal people, someone that has five ETH or, you know, like we don't have 32, um, it's kind of you, you're giving up your keys um, and it's kind of encouraging that. So I, I don't know. It, I, I just, it doesn't feel right, you know. I guess there are different ways you could look at it. You could be maybe operating on a multi-sig wallet where you um, have got multiple signatories who control the wallet where there's, 
whether 32 ETH is staked or you could create it as a business. I mean, there are different options that you can, I guess, um, take a look at. I, I, the thing that's interesting about it is how easy is it to do, right? And I feel that we're trying to reduce some of the friction. And I think 32 ETH and trying to come up with it if you don't have it all yourself, you know, that's another point of friction to perhaps retail investors participating. Yep. And by retail, I mean people who are not sophisticated investors who don't have more than, say, $2 million in um, net assets or $250,000 um, in, in income who would be able to ostensibly, well, you know, probably afford that kind of an outlay. And this is also very much focused on Ethereum. Like um, there are many other blockchains with their nodes and to stake on their nodes is, is a very different proposition and certainly not anywhere near 32 ETH. So, you know, it, it is um, there's opportunities yeah, one hundred percent. Like I think the the Tezos one was one hundred and thirty dollars or something minimum, wasn't it? Something like that, Sophie. Um, it's yes, I think it's well, it was roughly around ten thousand US, so considerably less, yet still, you know, a certain amount. Um, whereas if you looked at say Cardano, um, their network, uh, there is no requirement for having um, an amount. However, the algorithm does favour if you are willing to put some risk capital <laughs> and stake that, as you can imagine. Yeah. And then there's also what Layer 1X is doing with our um, novel proof of participation, which is a hybrid. We have a proof of stake and proof of participation. And the proof of participation validation is actually done by mobile phones, which means anyone with a mobile phone can participate in the validation and effectively be running a partial node and getting rewarded for their participation in the network. So, um yeah, there's there's lots of different ways to participate, and and the barriers are coming down, so it's not really a thirty two ETH proposition anymore. Well, that was intense, the most intense crypto podcast I've ever heard. So let's take a break. So while you're taking a break, check out orangebrickroad.com.au. Today's sponsor, well, me anyway. Okay, on our website we have all sorts of stuff. We've got courses. We have also the Crypto Academy, which consists of the different types of um, things that we're doing. You can join our community. We have a, a free community. We have different consultants that specialize in different areas of crypto, from security to DeFi to tax professionals all types of people also our blog our resources and our frequently asked questions which is a bunch of videos that basically go for three to five minutes each and it's what about blockchain proof of work etc etc so join the newsletter our free resources and um yep we'll just leave it at that oh also our facebook twitter youtube and linkedin okay thank you very much guys have a good day how the fuck do i stop that from recording stop recording all right cool. um, yeah and, but see it's pure form of capitalism is what i love about um you know crypto is that now that um the ethereum has sent the back bench market 32 so cut out certain participants now that opens up an, uh, a market opportunity for other companies to now fulfill that need that the, the, um, that Ethereum are not doing by having the 32. So you're going to get companies that are going to come out and, and compete with with that, basically. Yeah. And I'm not being critical about the 32 ETH. I mean, I think it's comparable to, you know, whatever um, the blockchain. I mean, you can do business however you want to, um, and the network effect will be seen by, you know, how many will, are willing to participate uh, at that level, obviously being the first uh, blockchain to run smart contracts, you know, you do have a bigger network effect, a lot more applications that are running and using um, those blockchain rails. So therefore, you know, providing security is probably, uh, and also iterations of the development of the code base is something that requires, you know, a greater investment. So uh, it does, I, th I think there's, there, there's a reason for it. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I yeah, I agree. But like, um, you know, a, a theory like I think we're just digressing a bit at the moment. But I'll just cover yeah. this real quick. Is is like, um, Ethereum is the first market mover when smart contracts basically, you know, and it's become so, and it's been great, and people have built on it, and there's been a lot of stuff done on it. But because it was the first market mover, it's also become very heavy, and you've mm-hmm. got these other lighter, more nimble blockchains that are starting up that you know are, are fulfilling that needs that. Um, it's like uh, having a big cruise ship is the way I think of, of of Ethereum. In order for them to turn, you know, they have to do it yeah. or to change something. It's going to take forever. So, yeah. you know, look, you know, say, can it, can Ethereum stick around? Absolutely. Can it fail? I think absolutely as well. Because, you know, you think of MySpace, you know, like things like that back in the day. Um, you know, you wouldn't have uh, Blockbuster, you know, these big companies that were first market movers that don't exist anymore. You know, I hope Ethereum sticks around. I love what they do. Um, but there are a lot of competing blockchains at the moment that are fulfilling needs that, um, you know, are, are well worth investing in. And the reason we're talking about Ethereum is simply because, you know, this is what's been covered in the report. Yeah, that's right. We can actually pretty broaden much. it out. We, well, yeah. there is more generic information, but we can broaden yeah. it out. Even though this specifically relates to Ethereum, we can talk about it in a more broader sense. Um, yeah. Well, this is where the data is being captured from. So it's yeah. talking about, you know, NFT creators um, being able to earn, or they actually have earned rather, more than 1.9 billion royalty revenues over the um, course of, you know the, the data analysis so i i think that's i think that's amazing i think what's amazing thing. about that is not yeah. so much the blockchain but the concept of this new economic model which is enabling royalties to be integrated into the web3 space and for you to be able to have a direct relationship with your fan base and cut out um, cut out the middleman, so to speak, which has been the traditional business model, um, and and yeah, monetize your own talent um, in whatever you're creating. So this is this is a model where creators maybe earned ten percent, and the the companies behind them got ninety percent of the pie. Whereas this flips that on the head, and um, obviously creators should be really incentivized to to put their work on the blockchain because this is where they'll really benefit. So this well, is really interesting, this um, graph, because it's month on month from 2021 up to 2023. And as you can see, you know, the peak is, um, I think it's about May 2022. Um, and then it, um, you know, it, it, maybe it's at May, you know, it kind of like takes a dive, um, you know, four months later. And there's a struggle in terms of how royalty revenue is being um collected by marketplaces and given back to creatives. Uh, that well, being I, said, I think that's been proven that there is, there, it is necessary to, to, to do something about it. And I'm just hoping that blockchains will take that into consideration or marketplaces at least, you know, how to um, compensate with royalty income creatives. Well, I, I 100% agree. But I think the, the elephant in the room with that is, okay, as, as an artist or a creator, a musician, um, you know, or, you know, I don't, I don't know, um, whatever it may be, that $1.9 billion has gone back to them. So imagine what that actually does for the artist. I mean, it gives them money to then be to continue doing art you know because let's face it most musicians or artists they're pretty much on the dole or they're just sort of struggling but now that money is going back to them they can spend more time with the art they can buy better equipment they can do more study they can do more social media stuff you know what i mean like because the money's going directly back to them so i think it's going to be an explosion in the art and music industry because the artists now can afford to be an artist whereas before 90 percent of their income went elsewhere yeah, I completely agree with you. That's what value is about. I mean, maybe Angsley, you'd want to offer. Well, something. I think as well the the um, the one point nine billion that has been referenced on that graph is is about the NFT um, cultures that currently exists, and that is sort of the PFP these these great communities that have developed. Um, um, based on community and really not a lot of utility, um, whereas NFT technology and what it can deliver, um, you know, you can tokenize your house with NFTs. You can do, yep. uh, you know, you can digitize your and 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 uh, ensure your privacy with um, using um, NFTs as your digital identity. NFTs have so 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 much utility, which is only just we're, we're only on the precipice of that really being uh, delivered and. Um, for traditional artists like well artists and and musicians and everything um 
their adoption of NFTs in delivering their creative talents is only just starting. And so if you, you know more about this than anyone with Ocean. I was going to, exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't mind just referencing the music industry. I mean, you know, you have artists um, and they are doing amazing things. You know, they're able to sell out their collections of, say, um, a song and basically get, you know, maybe 50 to 100 um you know, people buying it, they can raise anywhere up to, you know, $4,000, $5,000. It doesn't sound a lot, but if you think about a million um, listens on Spotify to make $4,000, US whereas you sell your NFTs as an artist, you're able to basically, um, you know, use that money to plow back into creating your next song or potentially your EP or, you know, your album. So there is that spin-off effect. So I think the music industry is coming a little bit later to the game, but um, they mm. definitely... Web3 artists in, in the market now who are clearly not going away and they really want to have a more direct relationship with their fan base so that they can do just this, generate yep. revenue well, that's, themselves. That's right. And it's, it's adding value in a sense too because we, with you certain packages of NFTs, it can be like, okay, you get front row seats to three of our concerts, uh, and but you also get a, a phone call from the lead guitar player and you get a, a T-shirt and, you know, you know, and you have ownership over a package of, of you know, like um, they get a signed copy of the the album, whatever it may be, mm. and that can then obviously, as the NFT can be, as it goes up in value or whatever, can be on sold, you know, but the package itself can remain. So what the uh, you know that these artists and and musicians are doing is they're giving added added value and connection to their fans directly, you know. And, and one thing as well. Value. Oh, sorry, sorry, Brandon. Um, one one thing as well as as the um blockchain infrastructure develops is that currently these early adopters, these early musicians and artists who have kind of had to choose where they're going to focus. They're going to have to, right, we're going to do this on Ethereum. Right, we're going to do this on Solana. But um, in the future when they're, and this we're, we're, we're really on the precipice of this again, in the future where um, they won't have to choose a blockchain so they can access everywhere. So their fans, they might have a fan base who love one particular blockchain or another one and they can access everyone and so they don't have to sort of be siloed as well so um you, you know they'll be able to meet their fans where they are which is um which will obviously be better for their business as well better and for i think growth. it's going to be better for adoption you know we don't have to choose they find their fans wherever their fans are actually wherever they are yeah, yeah and the artist rather is located in terms of um, their business offering this is an interesting one as well i mean it's been proven that you know the big brands are more the laggards they come in after something has been proven i'm not that familiar with any of the particular nfts but i think it was just interesting to have that integrated into the report to see that some big brands have also taken on um you know, using NFTs for very specific purposes, whether in metaverses or, um, you know, just as a proxy for collecting yeah, <laughs> something yeah. of um, artistic value. Any thoughts on that? Well, they become their own asset, really. So, uh, for example, Nike, they do the their sneakers and they do a collection of sneakers and they they might every every well I, I don't know if this is a campaign this is the one thing they can do is every sneaker pair can have its own nft now if that if that particular design ends up being a bit of a cult classic then obviously the tradable version of the real thing becomes a, a, a an asset as well and uh and and you and the same way you do football cards and baseball cards and everything, okay. these NFTs can become collectible. So it's it's really just a, a secondary market for these big companies building off their brand. And, you know, one of the things that I, I like to think about is Disney. Imagine Disney, if every um, ticket to Disneyland or ticket to a movie was an NFT of, of one particular scene or one particular frame in, in their movies and uh, that movie became a classic and you've got, you know, it, there's just so many ways for them to not only extend their particular um, potential monetization but their branding as well and uh, they've all got a whole lot of assets to be able to, to work with. And maybe just talking yeah. about your film there, um, potentially like there could be, I don't know, some benefit, some dividend, I don't know, for example, potentially that might be accrued with owning a portion of, I don't know, a few frames out of a movie for NFTs. I'm not quite sure, but I guess the yeah. use cases are there to be proven, hey? Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, the, the, the these larger companies, um, um, 
once again, I'll use the like the container ship or the cruise ship analogy is like they're they're huge companies, they're making money, um, and but all they have to do is just keep on doing what they're doing, righty? Like so, why should we change? Why should we adopt a you know a, like a new technology or any uh, emerging uh, you know tech or anything like that? And I think they're starting to do that now is because they realize that they're going to be losing market share soon. Do you know what I mean? By not participating on the blockchain. Um, so it's it's kind of like forcing them to do it um, and as the new generation are coming through. And the only reason these companies are doing and looking at these things is because of money. You know, that they're not doing it to help the tech out. You know, <laughs> they're literally mm-hmm. doing it for market share. So they're looking at it at the moment because they do realize in three to five, 10 years, whatever it may be, if they do not, then they're going to be losing a large portion of market share. And that's a nice segue into this next um, slide here because you can see consumers spent an estimated $67.9 billion on digital in-game purchases. Now, that might be on Web 2 and Web 3 gaming, but that's where the market is. So um, I'm really interested in in the the whole gaming experience because um, to date, Web 3 games haven't really offered the same experience as Web 2 games, but... um, when they get it right, um, which is very, very soon, <laughs> um, what the user will have is the ability to monetize their own their own assets. So they can play games, um, they can um, choose to participate in in-game advertising where they're rewarded um, in the game. They're potentially, um, we had Axie Infinity in the last bull run where people were making full-time incomes and selling off assets. That's right. And that's what, mm-hmm. so, so can you imagine? these web two companies who aren't participating in the blockchain all their customers are going to be in the blockchain because and in web three gaming because they are able to actually own their experience and monetize their own experience doing something that people are obsessed by so the thing about web three gaming to date has been it's been a very slow and clunky affair yeah and um and also it's been very siloed again but um being able to access um, the Web 2 graphics and apply them to Web 3, yep. being able to do cross-chain gaming where you can have an asset on Solana and play in an Ethereum game and being able to monetize that experience is just all-powerful and it's actually happening now. I think yep. this is, like it says here, you know, to the beginning of all of these slides, this is a trend I feel that is going to expand and can only be improved upon. In fact, just as a little quick aside, on LinkedIn, I've had people outreach to me from the Philippines saying, oh, I'd like to play your Axie Infinities. Can I be your, uh, <laughs> you know, your your manager? Can I manage them for you? Can I earn you income? And I said, well, actually, I'm not, <laughs> you know, a gamer in the Axie Infinity space, but uh, my cousin who bought three Free, you know, whose son didn't want to play them. So I said, well, look, go into a guild and see if you can find someone who's got a reputation, who can play them on your behalf and earn that income. So I think it's a fascinating area that can only improve. And um, yeah, they are a bit clunky. And I think there's yeah. just a vast space for um, improvement of user experience. And then also uh, we need to remember that even some of these economies, these crypto economies that are built like Axie Infinity, you know, they don't last forever. When you create a game economy, you've got to build it for the time period of the business that you want to operate for. So if you think about, uh, for example, the um, public companies in America, there's the statistics are the average public company runs for 23 years. So you wouldn't want to have an economy that runs out before 23 years if you want to use the law of averages and run an economy for the time period of an average business. So um, it makes you wonder just what thought goes into the economy that you need to pay out if, in fact, you are going to pay out and incentivize um, users. Yeah, but if you look at the technology at the moment, it's in the gaming. Yeah, yeah, it is a bit clunky. But do you uh, do you guys remember dial up? You yeah, know, when well, you're loading yeah, sure. <laughs> loading up a web screen, it'd just be like one line at a time. One line, you're just sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. If you had gone back then and gone, okay, this is too slow. Nobody's ever going to adopt this because it's too clunky. You know, but it was better than what you had before because before you didn't have websites. You know, and you couldn't access things and that sort of stuff. So, I, yeah, things are clunky and they're not as seamless as they are at the moment. But you just think of the evolution of 
you know, dial up to what we're doing right now, streaming. In a, and it's a very short period of time when you think about it, you know. We've gone from that to this. So that's where I think, and especially with the amount of developers that, that are working on blockchain and, and uh, Web3 and gaming, you know, it, it's going to just increase exponentially, you know. Yeah. Very and one thing that's also um, ha has changed with the advent of um, the blockchain crypto space is is governance. I mean, you know, that's not something that we can look past how those who are token holders or who perhaps are staking their tokens um, in governance um, consensus protocols, they have a say in how the community or the development of it, you know, operates or they have the capacity to put forward improvements that need to be made. So, um, you know, this is a really, I think, powerful part of the thesis that participants can literally participate and be part of that governance structure. Yeah, and it's, it's not top down either. Like, um, I, I don't know if this is a correct um, uh, analogy or whatever. But Twitter, for example, imagine if Twitter was on a DAO and people could vote. So then they could turn around and say, okay, this woke nonsense, we can, you know, should we vote on it? Should we allow that? Should we allow certain hate speech or how, how we determine what hate speech is and what can be put up and uh, and what is regarded as disinformation? So on a DAO, you can have that governance and that flexibility as opposed to someone like Elon Musk coming in with billions of dollars and just taking over it and going, oh, I want it like this now. And people are very happy with that. They go, well, that's great and good on you, Elon, and big ups to him. But what if someone just comes in and buys him out and decides to do the complete opposite? That can happen. But on a DAO, it's sort of this more democratized type of thing. Does you would like to hope so. I think that's the principle. I feel what's interesting is the quantum of assets that DAOs hold. <laughs> you know, yeah. they do actually have um, some decision making or decision making over the treasury assets that are there to educate or to upgrade or to help the improvement of these blockchains. So, um, yep. And I think this, what, what's coming down the pipeline, particularly in, a, in Australia, there's a thought about, uh, let me see, what is it, limited liability DAOs or something of that nature, or corporate DAOs. Um, so I feel the yeah, various regulatory kind of like pressures are forcing perhaps DAOs or encouraging DAOs to take on a legal status, whereas before it was the code, it was the number of tokens that you hold. Any yep. comment on that? Not from me. No, well, <laughs> I think you pretty much covered it. It was good. Yeah. How are we doing for time? I think we've got about 10 minutes to run and we've got um, quite a few to get through. So I was just thinking, like, um, maybe let's look at where some of the um, perhaps interesting pieces, if you've got a slide that you want me to skip to i'm happy to do that it's just oh, interesting to see that america is taking a dive in terms of you know where it has traditionally seen itself to be as a major market player so and it's yeah. interesting all the emerging technologies which are really embracing like thailand um you know india's just incredible singapore government um you know a lot of these a, a lot of countries are really embracing blockchain as a key uh, key part of their financial future, um, whereas the US is doing the opposite. And, um, you know, who knows how it's going to play out for them. Yeah, well, like, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, come out of nowhere and was competing with other tech companies, whatever. So I, I just see it's almost like a transition. Um, and I, I just cannot believe that the US are just doing what they're doing at the moment. And, you know, other countries, and once again, the global free market, other countries will take up the helm, you know. So yeah, I think it's wonderful. It. Yeah, it's yep. wonderful how, you know, space has been claimed. I think that's the best way to look at it. Space has been claimed globally, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> to build out the momentum of yeah. development. So it doesn't actually necessarily depend precisely on what's happening. Um, in and the also the decentralised um, aspect of it. Uh, you know, this technology is not going away. You can't kind of squeeze toothpaste back in the toothpaste, uh, yeah. you know, um, tube. So uh, this is a very... Um, almost democratizing technology and the the innovation on it is going to uh you know change the world 
Yeah, well, just instead of having like, uh, you know, floors and floors of, of developers and, and programmers, all that in, in a building, now they're all scattered across the world, you know, and they can be working on one project, you know, but they can be in the Philippines and in parts of Africa and Portugal and the US and that sort of stuff, you know. So, Absolutely. yeah, you, you, you're not, like you said, you're not putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah, this is interesting. I think we're going to dive into a little bit more, you know, technology markets, as we know, um, they depend upon, you know, innovation and adoption, innovation by the builders, and then um, adoption by the users and consumers. So maybe we could just like, um, have a quick look through what are the indicators of, um, of this innovation and adoption. So um, on the supply side, see, this is really interesting. The active number of developers, interested developers, contracted de deployers, verified smart contracts. So this is very much kind of like focusing on, um, you know, the, the creatives um, in the space as being an indicator of um, of new trends. So I think that's that that's that's pretty cool. And if you mm. look at the um, number of developers, I mean, it must be close to thirty-seven thousand roughly active developers um, who are active during any given month so that's the peak back in 2022 but it certainly hasn't dropped away to give the impression that you know developers are disinterested in the markets I guess Angsley you can see that firsthand in your oh absolutely absolutely um I think people are desperate. There have been, uh, there's been quite a lot of economic pressures which have forced developers out of the market. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of opportunities with new initiatives in the space that where developers are just moving to. Yep. And I think it's a really powerful statement as well. Where developers go, they initiate a network effect I mean look at the DeFi markets you know back in 2020 2021 you know where the developers were actually iterating and creating new products for the market you know that's where a lot of um, excitement was opened up in terms of you know that flywheel effect and I guess you know social media has a lot to do with it as well um, yeah. introducing people who are neither developers nor active in the markets to participate so this once again goes once again goes to GitHub repositories, and if you don't know about that, those are places where developers will open an account and um, create their source code or keep files of um, their source code, which can be um, shared. So you know these are just yeah, like it says, indications of activity for 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 trends and um, yeah for participating in the crypto markets. I think it's all very positive. Deployment of contracts, smart contracts. This is an interesting one. Verifying yeah. smart contracts. That's really interesting because this shows a bit more seriousness, actually a lot more seriousness, doesn't it, on behalf of the developers. They want their code base to be um, verified. They want others to make commentary on it. Um, it's, it's part of what could potentially be an auditing system, but it's not quite there. But it is a public um, kind of like demonstration of what they've created and built. And it does show innovation is happening because this obviously must represent new markets coming in, new new development happening um, where um, particular segments of the market might might be falling back, like the NFT segment. But you look at how many verified smart contracts there are, it's growth upon growth. So even though this is referencing Polygon Phantoms, Cello, Arbitrum and Optimism, I mean, I think it's worthwhile looking at you know other blockchains if you can. Um, and you can see that data mainly in blockchain explorers that will give you um, an indication. So one thing I think which is incredible about all the data that's here in this um, report is they come from public source, public sources for the most part. Um, I think June is maybe a paid service, so they take some of their analysis from there. But for the most part, they go to, um, you know, secondary source data, which is made available free. And that is something we shouldn't um, underestimate in terms of the specific characteristic, I feel, or the democratic characteristic of these markets is the access to information. There's, there's very little friction. And this is very different from the traditional finance markets. You simply don't get to see, you know, the transaction flows with the banking system unless you're part of the industry, you just don't see it. You don't know what their cost base is either. You don't know what the payments and the rewards are to the banks. Right. That's the thing, even though the delivery of the the, the smart contract is decentralised and it's trustless and um, is absolute, 
it's all very transparent. You can just look on the chain. You can just look on chain and it's all there. There's no secrecy about it, even though the the delivery of it requires no trust at all. It is absolute. So what incredible technology. And if you look back on the the last three charts that you've done and uh, you see like uh, 2016, 2017, like every single one of them charts, there's literally, it's barely reading right um and then as we're going into 2022 to 2023 or even the 21 to 23 that's where it's just going exponential growth Mm -hmm. you know so you you go where you're treated the best right so all these developers all these people that it they're coming to this industry in droves now we're only talking about 2016 2007 that's not all that long ago (laughs) you know look at the growth you know, that's just phenomenal. Well, like I said, you go where you treat it best and that's why there is so much interest in in these technologies because developers, they want to stay ahead of the game and want to be relevant and want to be a part of something as opposed to just doing like a normal job. So it's just incredible. It barely registers in 2016, 2017. One thing mm. that um, Eddie, the um, CTO of A16Z was saying was like in his conversations with um, developers, they were asking him, look, where's the best place for me to incorporate? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, I want to be in the area, but, you know, w- where do I go <laughs> to set up business? So anyway, sure. I feel that this is all um, substantial and helping people have confidence that, you know, if you are going to participate in these markets, there is a positive trajectory going forward. This is interesting also, you know, academics generally tend to um, do research in areas that um, have, you know, a long, long-term benefit. You know, we can think a lot about academia, <laughs> but I feel yeah. it kind of points in the direction of um, of, a, of a trend, right? Well, well, I think in academia, like, uh, poorly, um, but um, in this sense, maybe a bit differently. As you imagine in 2015, 2016, 2017, and you'll go, okay, in five years' time, you know, 2022 or whatever, you can do university degrees in, in blockchain technology, mm-hmm. you know, and all these other courses that universities run now using crypto and, and that sort of stuff. That, w- that was like a pipe dream back in 2016, you know? Right. Whereas now, um, you know, we went to an event the other week and it was hosted by the University of Western Australia who have a fantastic blockchain course. Yeah. And some of the attendees were from a local high school who were doing uh, cyber security and blockchain uh, right. development as, as a high school. So that's fantastic to see. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the countries, uh, Singapore was there and their whole education system is being very much geared up to support blockchain technology and then becoming world leaders in it. And that's yep. where it's heading, isn't it? It yep. started in the be- in the beginning, didn't it? You know, like back in the day, it was um, you know developers working with developers, you know, forums, um, you know, non academic studies. I think I did my first MOOC back in twenty thirteen, so that was interesting. Anyway, you know, like an open um, university course with thousands of people around the world, and I think Andre Santinopoulos is one of the teachers. But it's since become instantiated into actual curriculum. So I think that just goes to show that publications from um, universities you know is, is flourishing um, but even the language that we're just using now you know or oh, back in the day like we're, we're old people you know what i mean it was only 2016 2017 it wasn't all that long ago you know but i'm sounding like my granddad oh back in my day you know oh. i had to uh, walk on my hands to school because i wasn't allowed to wear out my shoes you know <laughs> it kind of sounds like that uh, but it's not all that long ago And we've got crypto related jobs. I mean, like there's a lot of like information here in this report. And I would just encourage people to go and download the state of um, crypto report um, and take a look. This is a little bit more on the consumer side. I know, Ainsley, with your, um, you know, like role in marketing, you'd probably be very sensitive, you know, to um, this information, like the active number of addresses that are being steadily growing as um, adoption moves on i mean look at 2023 you know we see a spike a positive spike and that's the month of march Um, it's incredible and that's having that's the users having to deal with the current uh experience the user experience that they have and the user interface that they have now when that is a much more elegant and user-friendly experience i just can't imagine how exponential that that growth and adoption curve is going to go uh 
And we talk about a bear market, yet, you know, this is probably, this is one of the kind of highest ranking months. Um, and this is not even all of the blockchains, like this is a subset of them. So um, I think this is showing, you know, consumer interest um, demand for sure. Transaction fees, how transaction fees and volume of activity um, is related you know, we're seeing approaching, you know, some of the highs that we saw back in 2021 and in, in the bull market. So it's quite incredible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's an interesting slide a few down, um, which is wallet. Um, this one? Uh, yes. So, and you can, you can, so I think one of the main indicators of this have been the collapse of those centralized things like FTX and, uh, Celsius. Uh, trust in Celsius and yeah so I think that's had a big impact of people just pulling their assets off chain and and just yeah shutting down their their vulnerable wallets perhaps mm -hmm. yeah I'd agree with that Absolutely. it'd be interesting to see what is the um the elevation and demand for hard wallets <laughs> and you know custodial wallets um well non-custodial wallets rather mm. Mm. So once again, looking at the volume of, of, of uh, trading, so it's looking like, you know, decentralized trading volume is, you know, it's heading on its way up. I mean, it's still substantially lower than what it was at the peak um, during the bull market. But, you know, these indicators are showing, you know, positivity. And shows are healthy. Because... Yeah, that's right. It is basically just a correction, you know. Um, so it's just sorting out the bad players and the, the good ones are going to be sticking around, but everything is on the upside. And this is, is interesting, positive. NFT buyers as well. You know, this is all about the participants, the consumers, the users. Um, you know, they're increasing. I know that I did quite a few trades around December. Um, the price of ETH was actually pretty high compared to what I was paying for my um, NFTs, my music NFTs. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's gratifying to see that nonetheless, you know, NFT buyers are still out there. They're active. Yep, and it's only just beginning. And this is an interesting one as well, stable coins. I mean, I think stable coins always have a valid place in the market. They're a place where often, you know, trading profits can be held until one goes back into the market again, or they're great for transactions where you really want to have price parity. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and in the very near future, they will be... Uh, uh, used to buy real world assets you'll be able to use yep. your crypto wallet to buy um do micro transactions to buy your cup of coffee with your usdt that's something that that we're able to deliver and um, you know it's going to be a reality to everyday life with that you can actually just convert your stable coins convert your crypto into your cup of coffee and and so the demand for that will will remain the demand for stable coins and it's quite fun because here in uh, Perth, you can actually buy beer, coffee, and um, home yeah. gifts down in Fremantle. <laughs> yeah, amazing. And, and, and Shopify, for example, has you know allows you to use crypto to buy your buy your real world assets. So yeah, yeah. Cri crypto spend is, an, is another card, and crypto uh, CRM card. You know, so where crypto spend, you can just go in and just tap and go like anywhere else and you can spend whatever you want, whether it's Ethereum, Bitcoin, stable coins or whatever. And you actually get rewarded like you do with um, uh, flybys. You get rewarded in XRP. So, so I'm rounding yeah. off towards the end of the report. And I think, um, you know, this is um, quite an exciting place to, to, to conclude. Um, so this is literally the state of crypto index. So it's an actual legitimate index, which um, A16Z are going to be updating on a month by month basis. So I feel it's going to be really helpful um, as a tool for anybody to track both, you know, innovation within the um, cryptocurrency sector and then also um, adoption by users. So there's the product side and there's also the um, user consumer side that is a part of this. It's a very complex, um, I think, weighted index. And those are all of the metrics that go, or indicators rather, that go inside it. 
So you can see on the innovation side, they want to be tracking, you know, developer, um, smart contract verification, library downloads, publications, and then job searches. I think they give job searches quite a low um, level. It's around 2.5% in terms of their contribution to the index. And then on the adoption side by users, um, you know, you can see there, you know, what would users be doing? Consumers, obviously, they'll be using their addresses. They'll be engaged in transactions, paying fees, um, using their mobile wallets, or maybe less so now, <laughs> but, you know, using uh, DEXs, buying NFTs or stable coins. I any comments on the way that you see this as a useful or a useful framework for, for investors or for anyone basically interested in the markets? Well, it's always, um, it's always looking at past performance, isn't it? So, um, it, you know, these are these are probably the right attributes to be measuring. Um, yeah, and it just shows, I guess, the uh, the snapshot of where crypto is and it's in its current state based on, on past indicators. Yeah, it's, it's it's basically just a snapshot, isn't it? You know, and go, okay, we've done a snapshot now. In twelve months' time, we're going to do a comparison to what we snapshot of last year and see what metrics have grown. As long as they keep their metrics the same then you can consistently see growth or lack of growth or all that sort of stuff, you know. I think what's interesting about this, um, I did see a demo of it, that you can actually change some of the weighting um, aspects of it. If, for example, oh, okay. from point of view that, um, for example, developers or active developers is a little bit higher than 15 or 10 percent, you can make some some variations to it. Oh, so, that's okay. clever. So you, you can make the stats say whatever you want. <laughs> so, yeah. It sounds like a government Typical department. Statistics. There you go. That's how you do it, everyone. Well, I think I think it depends on. For example, yeah, I, yeah. I I agree, and I feel that um, these are not static markets, right? So, if for example, active developers goes right down, or interested developers, you know, goes right down, um, you, you know, what else would would drive the market? Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? I like number 57, slide 57. We're getting towards the end. But yeah. I like it's, it's still good. early days. Yeah. And when you think about the whole, you know, Bitcoin was born, what, on the 3rd of January 2009. So the whole blockchain technology is is 14 years old. We are still so early. And, and I think we're at such an exciting stage because now the market's been through sort of four cycles where a lot has been learned and more and more people are coming on and I think the next cycle is really going to be that mass adoption cycle because um, it will be a much easier experience. I think the conversation throughout crypto Twitter, throughout developers, um, certainly in our company is really how do we onboard everyone in a really streamless a streamlined seamless way and these early days I think the next next couple of years are going to see that exponential growth in users and and also in innovation on the chain yeah yeah I'd like to add to that. yeah it's very exciting Brandon um, and Ainsley and I'd like to see you know the innovation that comes through I'd also like to just comment on the fact that even though this is historical data it does show that you know the transacting addresses have been you know outperforming average internet use um, by cryptocurrency <laughs> interested um, you know people this is this is incredible it just shows a very high level of um, participation so this is what we could be expecting going forward um, yeah, I mean, look at any one of those, um, you know, from DAOs through to, um, I don't know, the, the the products that are going to be built. I, I feel like it's a wide open um, space at the moment. And my only thought would go to capital um, that, you know, all these businesses do require, you know, capital to continue operating, to continue building and to continue advancing. So mm -hmm. my hope is that, you know, the capital markets, you um, are there to support these businesses or that somehow they're able to raise um, interest, financial interest um, through the communities directly? Well, if they've got utility, you know, and, and they've got market fit, then you're going to get capital. As long know. as you don't run out of runway, really. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's always that too. <laughs> And there are some disclosures there. This is the views of, um, you know, the individuals who wrote it. Um, and I don't recall who wrote it, but they are um, obviously personnel of A16Z. So, 
yeah, any concluding comments before we um, finish up? I've got a couple. I, I've, I've just had a few thoughts as I was reading this and there are a few things that um, that I believe um, are really, really important for the crypto space. First of all, we this report shows that how quickly the space is moving because it doesn't mention artificial intelligence at all. Um, and that's going to be a major, major impact on not just the the blockchain and and the Web three technology, but but every facet of our lives in the next um, couple of years. And I think really going forward, the the key factors that are going to deliver all these things that we're expecting um, are going to be a better user experience to help onboard the next billion users, and the key deliverable will be that um, in interoperability at a as a native level where there is where all the chains can work together and deliver the promise of web3 and once that is achieved then all the dapps and all the users can have a great and very safe um, experience within the ecosystem yeah, fully agree. Uh, you know, like the ninety percent of the uh, users on the internet actually use their phone. So, you know, uh, when it can be that seamless that you're just like, you know, uh, like like we do nowadays, we can use social media. We just it's on our phone. We we watch YouTube on our phone. We watch Netflix on our phone. You know, so once the the uh, you know where users are that familiar with it and it's, it's that easy. I think that is mass adoption. And I honestly think in the next two to three years, we haven't seen anything yet. You know, we're not, I agree. I'm, I'm not just talking about prices. I think the next two or three years is going to set up the next 15, 20 uh, for where tech is going and how it's going to be established. So it's a great time to be in the market and uh, a part of the technology. You know, I wish I had the smarts back in the day when, when people were going... Um, oh, someone um, bought bondibeach.com domain and then sold it to uh, the, the council for $1.5 million, right? And he literally bought it for five bucks. And you're like, hang on a sec, how can someone have a .com thing and, and it be worth money? You know, like, because my knowledge wasn't there yet. And, but I, now I feel like I've got a second chance being in crypto, whereas I'm sort of ahead of the curve because I'm reasonably educated in it. And just seeing what that did back then to what is about to happen in crypto, but I'm actually a part of it now. So, yeah, it's just going to be mental. Strap yourselves in. <laughs> it's very exciting. And I think for anyone listening, if they feel, oh, my goodness, I don't know anything about it, there's just so many resources for you to learn from. You know, Orange Brick Road, there's a fantastic communities here uh, in Western Australia, uh, in really all pockets of the world, um, where you can get involved with people who are really passionate about crypto. There's also um, a lot of education in, in the socials, in the Twitter, in the YouTube. Um, this space is for everyone. It's not a young person's space. It's It really is for everyone because this technology is going to impact all of our lives. Um, and it's really exciting and it's going to improve um, our lives uh, and keep us much safer and do so many things. Uh, and we're all going to be a part of it. So don't think it's too hard. Don't think you you don't get it. It'd be a part of it because it's it's going to change your world whether you like it or not. Yeah, it's, that, it's um, coming whether you like it or not. Yeah, I'd like to just agree with what you've been saying there, Brandon and Ainsley, and just add to that, you know, education is is critical. It's the, it's the key if you are, um, you know, not well-versed in the cryptocurrency space. Um, I think, you know, frameworks like this that are being offered are helpful, you know, to start actually getting a sense for, well, what are we talking about? Like, how do I understand, you know, the value of one blockchain versus another or one application versus another? Or what does this mean for me? You know, um, I know it is pretty in depth and, you know, this is the type of information that is used by venture capitalists to make comparisons between whether they fund um, businesses or not. Um, yeah, they yeah. metricize everything. You know, this is the traditional finance method which has been brought into these markets. So, you know, apart from that, as Ainsley was referencing, yeah, get involved in meetups here in Perth, Women in Blockchain WA. We've uh, revitalized that brand and we've had now two really successful events, three actually, so far this year. And we continue to um, yeah, bring new bring new information about what's happening in the space out there to pretty much anyone and everyone. So I do feel that you shouldn't think that you don't 
fit in because everyone's got their own journey into the cryptocurrency yeah. space. We weren't born into it. Well, I wasn't, you know, <laughs> I wasn't a code area developer by trade and I didn't kind of get raised with this as being the natural iteration, but I knew that there had to be um, a different way of interacting, you know, in the financial markets without going through banks. And, you know, I'm for one, I'm really grateful to see that this sector has, um, you know, emanated and yeah, we've just got such a lot of, yeah, just such a lot of opportunity to, to go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. Can we just stop the screen share and, um, and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, yeah, just just on that point is, um, I mean, there's, there is so many resources out there, like the orangebrickroad.com.au, that, that's a website, you can go to Frequently Asked Questions, there's about 15 videos there, they go for three to five minutes each, they cover things like what is proof of work, what's proof of stake, that sort of stuff. But more importantly, like you mentioned before, uh, and all the details will be down below um, for your guys' social media um, and, you know, website links, that sort of stuff. But um go to events, you know, go to meetups, go and meet these people in person, like the women, women in blockchain. Um, with, with, there's events happening all the time. It's constantly. Um, so yeah, go out, meet people, ask questions, get amongst it because now's a good time to be starting to learn about things, you know, and if you're not going to do it now, then when are you going to do it? You know, but there are resources out there. And like I said, um, all, everything will be in the description. Did anyone, did, uh, we're pretty much done. No last sort of thoughts or anything like that. No. Why I'm am good. I so? Why am I so amazing? I don't know. It just comes naturally. But thanks for asking. Um, cool. <laughs> you might have finished that. Yeah, cool. All right. Like I said, everything will be down below in the description. Um, uh, we'll have this up in the next day or two. Hopefully, I think Rick will get straight onto it. Um, so thank you very much, guys. Um. Thanks very much, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.